Hello and welcome back to Animal Sciences 142. Today we're going to look at part three of our lecture on cells and we're going to focus on membrane physiology. If you remember from previous lectures we said that the plasma membrane was composed of phospholipids and also plasma proteins and this forms an effective barrier that helps to regulate the passage of materials into and out of the cell. Now some of the substances that are regulated include things like ions and electrolytes whereas others include bodily fluids. While we're on the subject of bodily fluids, we should talk about the different fluids in the body. For example, there's intracellular fluid, that is fluid found inside the cytoplasm of the cell, but there's also extracellular fluid. This is the fluid that's outside the cell. Remember that the body, whether of a human or other mammals, is a very moist environment, so we have fluid pretty much in it everywhere. The other type of fluid we should talk about is something called interstitial fluid. This is the fluid that is extracellular that is found in the tissues in between cells. That's exactly what interstitial means, is in between. So now that we've learned about the anatomy of the cell membrane, we're going to take a look at its function or physiology. So the cell membrane or plasma membrane is a selectively permeable membrane. And this means that it allows certain substances to pass through, but not others. Now molecules can cross the plasma membrane in three different ways. The first of these is something called passive transport. Now passive transport is a downhill movement of molecules from one side to the other. And this basically requires no energy, but it does require something called a concentration gradient. On the other hand, we can use something called active transport to move molecules against their concentration gradient. However, this will use energy. And the third type, endocytosis, exocytosis, is actually a special type of active transport, which we'll cover in subsequent slides. Now the first transport mechanism we're going to talk about is passive transport. And passive transport, remember, does not require any external energy input, but it does utilize a process called diffusion. And diffusion is the natural tendency of a substance to spread out, moving from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. For example, take a look at the figure at right, and you can see in the leftmost beaker that I've just placed some food coloring molecules in the beaker of water. Now initially these food coloring molecules are most abundant or most concentrated at the bottom of the beaker. But look what happens over time. The dye molecules begin to spread out and out until at the right hand side of the screen you can see that the food coloring molecules are equally distributed throughout the beaker of water. And this is a characteristic of diffusion and that it eventually leads to a uniform concentration of the solute in the solution. Now the solution could be water or the solution could even be air. So think about uh, somebody that walks into a classroom and all of a sudden decides that they want to apply some perfume or some cologne. Now initially the people around that person are going to become aware of that cologne or perfume, but over the next 30 minutes or so that perfume is going to spread out throughout the classroom until it becomes uniformly distributed. That is everybody in the room can smell the perfume. So in a nutshell, diffusion is the movement of a substance from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration, and it doesn't require any external energy input. Now one question you might be asking is, what exactly is moving these solute or dye molecules around? Well, it happens to be the kinetic energy of the solution. In this case, the solution here that you see in the figure is water, and water is a liquid, and liquids have molecules that are moving around. And so as those molecules move around, they're going to inadvertently bump into some of those dye molecules and move those around too.
So in the past few slides, I've used some vocabulary words which you may or may not be familiar with. So in case you're not, we're going to go through these now. So basically, a solute is any substance that is dissolved in a solution. For example, the dye molecules we showed two slides back was a good example of a solute. On the other hand, a solvent is a substance in which a solute is dissolved. And in most cases, we're going to be talking about water as a solvent because it's the major solvent inside of living organisms. A concentration gradient basically just means that we have more of a substance on one side of a container or one side of a membrane than another. And remember, having a concentration gradient was a prerequisite to have any type of net diffusion. And finally, a selectively permeable membrane is a membrane like the cell membrane that allows some molecules to cross but not others. So let's take a look at an example of diffusion of solute molecules across the cell membrane. Now, how quickly a solute molecule will move across the cell membrane depends on a lot of factors. For one, the membrane has to be permeable to the solute. The other thing is we have to have a concentration gradient. And the concentration gradient just basically meant we had more of a solute on one side of the membrane than we did the other. And the steeper the difference between the two sides of the membrane, the more quickly uh, diffusion will occur. And so if the membrane is permeable to the solute, basically the solute molecules will move across that membrane going from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration until eventually we reach equilibrium. Now at equilibrium, there are equal concentrations of the solute on both sides of the membrane. Now this doesn't mean that molecular motion stops, but it simply means that every time a doll but it simply means that every time a dye molecule moves from the left side of the screen, another one moves from the right side of the screen. So at that point we say that we're at equilibrium. We're now going to take a closer look at the process of diffusion by observing the diffusion of sugar molecules throughout a water solution in a U-shaped tube. So here we have our U-shaped glass tube and imagine that it's filled with water. So water is going to be our solvent and sugar molecules will be our solute. So we're going to start out by dropping four sugar molecules into the left-hand side of the tube and 12 sugar molecules into the right-hand side of the tube. So the question now is, what's going to happen? Well, remember back to the principles of diffusion. Basically, diffusion is the movement of a substance from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. So the sugar was initially more concentrated on the right side of the tube than it was on the left side of the tube. And what this means is that the sugar will diffuse from the right side, where it's more concentrated, to the left side, where it's less concentrated. And this net diffusion will occur until we reach equilibrium. That is the point in which the sugar is equally distributed throughout all parts of the tube. Now remember, once this equilibrium occurs, that doesn't mean that the molecules stop moving, but only that they move equally in opposite directions. So now that we've talked about simple diffusion, we're going to go on to talk about a special case of diffusion called osmosis. Osmosis is the diffusion of water across a semi-permeable membrane. And in most cases, the membrane we're talking about is the cell membrane. Now, just like any other substance, a water diffuses by going from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. That is, it likes to go from an area where there's a lot of water to an area where there's less water. However, However, the diffusion of water is also affected by solutes. So it tends to go towards an area where there's more solute because that's an area that has less water. So in essence, the net diffusion of water will always be to an area of higher solute concentration. Now, if you're like most people, you're probably having a hard time wrapping your mind around this osmosis versus diffusion thing. If so, all you need to remember is one thing. Solutes suck. And that doesn't mean that solutes are drag or they're bad, but what it does mean is that solutes, like salt, tend to pull water towards them. Said in another way, water tends to move towards an area of greater solute concentration. So if you take a look at the picture at the top of the screen, you can see the salt shakers chasing the slug. Well, many of you know, and probably some of you have even tried this, if you put salt on a slug, which I don't recommend or condone, it will kill the slug by drying it out. That is, the salt on the slug's back will literally pull the water out of the slug's body, causing it to die of desiccation or drying out. And so this is a concept that we're going to see several times throughout this chapter and next, that water always moves to an area of greater solute concentration. 
So to better illustrate the process of osmosis, we're going to go back to our U-shaped tube full of water. Now the only difference here is that we've now divided the left and right hand sides of the tube with a selectively permeable membrane. This membrane is permeable to water but is not permeable to sugar. So it will let water cross but it will not let sugar across. Now just like in our last example, we're going to put four sugar molecules on the left hand side of the tube and twelve sugar molecules on the right hand side of the tube. And the question again is what will happen? Well, we can start out in saying that if the membrane was permeable to glucose, the glucose would simply diffuse from right to left, just like we saw a couple slides ago. But remember now that the membrane will not let glucose across, but it will let water across. So what will happen? Now, because the solute molecules themselves can't move, water will be sucked towards the area of greater solute concentration. That is, water goes down its own concentration gradient from an area where it had a lot of water to an area where there was less water. That is, it went towards an area where there was more solutes. Again, if you can't keep this all straight in your head, just remember solutes suck. And there was more solute on the right-hand side of the tube, and so that's the direction that water's going to go. Now we use the term tonicity to talk about the concentrations of solutes both inside and outside of the cell. For example, an isotonic solution would be a solution that has an equal solute concentration to the inside of the cell. And so if you take a look here, you can see that we have the exact same ratio of solutes to water both inside and outside the cell. And remember here that the membrane is probably impermeable to our salts or solutes, and so water is going to be doing the moving back and forth. And water is moving, but the point here is that there's no net diffusion of water. Because the solute is equally distributed on both sides of the membrane, water moves from left to right at the same speed at which it moves from right to left. And so we can say that we are at equilibrium. On the other hand, a hypertonic solution would have a greater solute concentration than the inside of a cell. So here you can see we have a lot more solute outside the cell than we do inside the cell. Again, assuming that this membrane is relatively impermeable to our solutes, but permeable to water, what do you think is going to happen? Well, remember that solutes suck. That is, water is always going to be sucked to an area where there's more solutes. And because there's more solutes outside the cell, the water is going to be drawn across the cell membrane from inside the cell to the outside of the cell. On the other hand, a hypotonic solution would be a solution that has less solutes than what's inside the cell. And so think about which way water is going to go here. There's more solute inside the cell, so that's the way that water is going to go. Cells placed in a hypotonic solution will actually suck up or gain water because there's more solute inside the cell than there is outside the cell. So here's a figure from an older edition of the textbook which shows what happens to cells placed in the three different types of solutions. Now take a look at the left hand side. You can see that we have a human red blood cell. We placed it in an isotonic solution. The arrows there indicate the movement of water. And because you can see that the arrows are the same size, this indicates that water movement in is the same as water movement out. And this is what we'd expect because an isotonic solution would have the same solute concentration that we would find inside of a cell. That doesn't mean that water stops moving, but that water moves into the cell at the same rate that it moves out of the cell. As a result, the size and shape of the red blood cell would be the same. It's normally going to look like a Cheerio. Now let's take a look at the middle picture we put a blood cell in a hypotonic solution. Remember that hypo means it has a lower solute concentration than what's inside the cell. So more solute inside the cell is going to cause water to be sucked into the cell. And that water being sucked into the cell is going to create more water movement in and less water movement out. And as a result, that red blood cell is going to swell and become bigger until at some point it's actually going to rupture. And finally, take a look at the right-hand figure. We've placed the same red blood cell in a hypertonic solution. Remember that hyper means a greater solute concentration, so there will be more solute outside the cell than there is inside the cell. And what do solutes do? That's right, they suck. The highly concentrated solution outside the cell is going to suck the water from inside the cell to the outside in the solution. As a result, that cell is going to shrink or crenate because it's been placed in a hypertonic solution. And that's why the arrow out of the cell is much longer than the arrow into the cell, because the net movement of fluid is out of the cell into the solution. 
So now that we have a basic understanding of the processes of osmosis and diffusion, we're going to go back to our friend passive transport. Now remember, passive transport utilizes diffusion to move things across the cell membrane. And diffusion does require a concentration gradient, but it does not require the expenditure of any ATP. That is, as long as we have a concentration gradient in our favor, it's going to happen for free. And there are three ways in which passive transport can move substances into or out of the cell. We can go through the phospholipid bilayer, we can go through protein channels, or we can utilize something called facilitated diffusion. So let's take a look at the first method, which is diffusion across the phospholipid bilayer. Now remember, the phospholipid bilayer makes up the bulk of the cell membrane, and that the tails of the phospholipids are very hydrophobic, and they tend to be more towards the middle of the bilayer. And so what this means is that polar molecules like water, or charged molecules, let's say like potassium, can't travel very easily through this bilayer. So what can get through are very small molecules, like oxygen gas, carbon dioxide gas, and also other lipids. Because remember, like dissolves like. And so cholesterol or triglycerides may be able to move fairly easily throughout the plasma membrane because they're also made of the same stuff. Now in the last slide we said that the lipid bilayer was permeable to very small nonpolar molecules, was not very permeable to water, and also very not permeable to ions, that is things with a charge. So how do we get things that have a charge or are polar across the cell membrane? And the answer here are protein channels. We have special transmembrane proteins which allow ionic substances and water into and out of the cell. In general, most of these proteins tend to be molecule specific. That is, if they let sodium through, they're not going to let calcium through. So examples of things that use protein channels are all ions and, of course, water. Another type of diffusion that utilizes transmembrane proteins is something called facilitated diffusion. Facilitated diffusion is very similar to the diffusion through the protein channels, but the only difference is, is that the protein undergoes a conformational change as the solid moves from one side of the membrane to the other. And so an example of this is the movement of glucose into the cell. So take a look at the left-hand side of the screen. At number one, you can see that glucose is binding to the transport protein. Number two, that protein changes shape. And number three, it spits the glucose out on the other side. Now, just like other forms of passive transport, we need to have a favorable concentration gradient. That is, in order for this to work, there needs to be more glucose on the outside of the cell than there is inside of the cell. Okay, now that we've talked about the three ways in which passive transport can be used to move things across the cell membrane, we're going to go to talk about active transport. And active transport differs from passive transport in that it specifically can push things against their concentration gradient, and it also needs a source of energy. And you might ask yourself, why would we ever spend energy or ATP on moving something across the cell membrane if it could happen for free with diffusion? Well, let's think about this. Remember, with diffusion, what's the greatest concentration you can get inside the cell? Well, that's the same concentration as it is outside the cell. So looking at it a different way, imagine that you have eight apples, and that you want to get those apples from outside of the cell to inside the cell. By using diffusion, the greatest number of apples you could get inside the cell would be four, because once we had four outside the cell and four inside the cell, we would basically be at equilibrium. But let's say I really like apples, or let's say another molecule that's important to the cell, and I want to bring them all inside the cell. In that case, I can use active transport to literally pull things from an area of low concentration to an area of high concentration. But in order to do this, I will need some kind of energy, mostly ATP. So one example of active transport is something called the sodium-potassium pump. The sodium-potassium pump is literally a membrane protein that pushes all the sodium from inside the cell to the outside of the cell and takes all the potassium from outside the cell and puts it inside the cell. And not only does this move things against their concentration gradient, but it also moves them against their electrical gradient. And the sodium-potassium pump is really important for cellular metabolism, but also for generating a difference in charge across the cell membrane. And this is especially used by neurons or nerve cells that use this difference in charge to communicate between different areas of the body. So we'll talk more about the sodium-potassium pump later on, but just realize that any time you see the word pump, we're talking about something that's utilizing energy, whether direct or indirect, to move a substance against its concentration gradient. 
Another type of membrane transport which uses energy and so would be called active transport is known as endocytosis and exocytosis. Now this is a type of transport used to transport very large molecules across the cell membrane. Now these would be molecules which couldn't diffuse through the bilayer and also couldn't fit through those special protein tunnels. So we tend to use it for very large, let's say carbohydrate molecules or protein molecules that move into or out of the cell. And both of these methods involve the formation of vesicles. So exocytosis would be the movement of a vesicle from inside a cell to an area outside the cell. For example, if we're making a protein in our rough endoplasmic reticulum and we want to extrude it from the cell, we'll do that through the process of exocytosis. On the other hand, endocytosis is a process where we take large molecules and bring them into the cell. And you can see that we first start with an invagination or a dimple in the cell membrane, and that dimple closes off until we have a membrane-bound vesicle of our molecules and we bring them into the cell. And of course after that, if it's a food molecule or a foreign molecule, we're probably going to take that vesicle and join it with one of our lysosomes. So endocytosis and exocytosis are used for the movement of large molecules, and yes, they do use energy.